Hello, everyone. We are going to start like uh, now. <laughs> so I hope everyone who wants to join joined us, and we'll have a wonderful discussion. So uh, my name is Alina. I am the presenting center for global IT cooperation. We're the organizer uh, of Russian IGF and Youth Russian IGF. Uh, so and today we'll discuss a wonderful topic, uh, dark web. Uh, I will make a remark that we will call everything we discuss the dark web, but it's not like the term that usually used to, to, to describe correctly what we're going to talk about, but because it's uh, common knowledge, we will speak about it. So what are we going to discuss today? And we'll try to understand why people basically are afraid of dark web and why uh, maybe dark web is not so threatening as we think, actually. And in the end, we'll try to uh, answer the one question. So is it a cybercrime heaven or just another layer of the web where our society can also find benefits? Uh, so we we're going to start with the basics uh, because people sometimes, they kind of mess with the terminology and they think that uh, dark web is actually something that only contains bad things and they mess it up with a thing called deep web. So our first speaker, Milos. Um, so can you please tell uh, what is the difference between deep web and dark web? So uh, thank you very much. You know, thanks, thanks for organizing this panel. It's very interesting you know, topic because uh, we should discuss about the dark web, deep web, and all challenges on the internet. But you know, speaking about, I, I will start with deep web. Speaking about deep web, uh, we should say that deep web is a part of internet which is unindexed. Speaking about conventional search engines like Google, like you know Yahoo, Yandex, and so on and so on. So uh, if we understand how internet works, we see some resources on the internet, uh, on a, you know, which is available. We have, we can easily search like on Google and so on and so on. But on another part, there are a lot of resources um, which are not available easily. So uh, we should understand the architecture of Internet. We have the main AIM system, we have IP addresses, and so on and so on. So if we see Internet as a global network, and I don't want to go into fragmentation processes and so on and so on, if we look Internet as a global available network in, in every part of our you know, world, we uh, should understand that there are a lot of resources which are available only via IP addresses. So uh, there are some different aspects, how we can control this, what's behind this, what, what can we do uh, accessing this, these resources. And uh, this is really interesting. So uh, speaking about dark web and deep web uh, in you know, our, uh, I would say, um, community, there are a lot of uh, confusions and misunderstanding. What is dark web, what is deep web? Many people would say that uh, dark web and deep web uh, are same you know, uh, concepts and speaking about terminology and so on and so on. But I, I, I would agree with this. So speaking about uh, dark web, uh, many people think that when we speak about dark web, we generally speak about uh, uh, some bad uh, behaviors, you know, uh, um, buying some weapons, uh, drugs, and so on and so on. But uh, on another hand, we should underline that uh, they are very, you know, similar approach when we speak about dark web and deep web. That I would say that uh, this is all about unindexed sources on the internet. So uh, we can do bad things uh, regularly when we visit some other uh, publicly available, I would say, resources. Speaking about Facebook, about about social networks, about uh, you know all other resources which we use every day. So it's not uh, only when we speak about dark web that this is a bad behavior, speaking about some illegal things and so on and so on. So uh, we should understand how internet works. And uh, I, I would conclude that if we compare dark web and deep web, that it's all about unindexed resources on the internet. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. And of course, yes, uh, the main concern of all the people that uh, dark web brings only cyber crimes that bring nothing wrong. So uh, our next spe speaker, Fifi, he will be joining us online. Uh, do you hear us? 
Um, yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, hi can Fifi. You. So my question to you, so in terms of cybersecurity, why uh, dark web tools for an ordinary user is considered dangerous? Okay, all right, thank you um, for this. And, and as my um, colleague um, explained the dark web, um, it could be, um, we have a, the good side and the bad side of it, not only for the criminal as um, aspect of it, but um, let me address it. Um, whenever we are using dark web tools, um, as you're saying, in terms of cybersecurity to the ordinary user, um, dark web can be very dangerous because um, we see that um, um, users are not familiar with how to use them safely. Um, so the how to use the dark webs um, um, can be also dangerous. If you, if you are able to use it safely because people use it and uh, they use it for criminal activities and other stuff. But there are some specific risks that um, it can be um, seen and involved when um, we are um, talking about um, dark web. One, it could be the malware aspect of it, uh, that is the aspect of the cybersecurity, whereby um, um, there are some distributed malware on the internet which contain the viruses, the Trojan, the ransomware people also use. Uh, we also have scams because using the dark web, um, there's a lot of scam because people use for illegal activities. So uh, we have people that they are um, being scammed like phishing, um, scam attacks, phishing meals, and that some other phishing ads that people may be targeted to the ordinary user. And also, let's see the illegal activity. Um, as my colleague was saying that, um, and people... Um, will be using it for some sexual um, aspect and, and child sexual abuse and materials and other stuff over the internet. And when you also uh, move forward, we also see the aspect of um, um, some people who don't have the capacity to um, 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 learn how they can use it. Um, this is in the sense that um, people who are using dark webs, um, in conjunction using with um, the criminals online at the same time. So they may not be able to see how they can protect themselves. And um, these are the various um, aspects of it that um, it, it is very uh, um, cyber concerned because the ability for you to use it very well wisely um, can also help you protect you. But also you might also know that um, dark web tools are not encrypted and um, they are um, not um, um, protected like unlike the normal applications as well. Although people use it for normal, normal um, 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 deep web applications for um, 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 general purposes, but um, they can also use for criminal activities. So the ability to use and also ability to protect yourself. And why is it the, it's for the ordinary user is that it's, it is not highly secure and encrypted, whereby the dark web um, also like you can be monitored any time for maybe with a third party organization or by for criminal um, offenses investigation. So these are the various concerns that um, we've been raising um, for the ordinary user because um, they, they are very prone to other um, threats on the internet when they are using that way because they, they think that they want to um, browse private or they want to access information private. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for input. Uh, so, uh, does anyone want to uh, add, Milos, want to add some stuff? I just want to, you know, clarify, when we speak about uh, deep web, dark web, and so on, we should understand that dark web is just a part of deep web. So, speaking about deep web, as I mentioned before, it's just a part, you know, of uh, overall network of uh, internet, and it's a majority, of course, but, you know, uh, when we speak about deep web, all unindexed, you know, resources on the internet. So, when we speak about illegal things and, you know, cyber crime and, and, and uh, everything which is actually, you know, um, trending topic today, we should understand that it's not only exclusively on a dark web or deep web or, you know, public resources, it's available everywhere. So when we speak about, uh, you know, dark web, we should understand that there are many uh, techniques for how you, how, how, you know, which gives you availability to hide your um, metadata and so on and so on, because, uh, you know, Tor browser, Onions protocol and the different techniques speaking about
about how to hide your, um, I would say, metadata. Yeah, that's actually metadata. So the main question, speaking about privacy, about you know security, uh, is how to uh, secure your own meta metadata in, in, in a concept of security. So uh, we should not make misconfusion and uh, uh, misunderstanding. Uh, dark web is a just part of deep web as uh, we can consider all the resources on the internet which are not indexed on the search on search engines as a part of deep web yeah so yes uh, this is the main uh, concern and the main confusion you're right so i want to ask izan why actually uh, like we know that like, people think that dark web only criminal activity, like only people that use databases and s steal them and uh, load them there and use it like for some kind of a, uh, bad behavior. But actually, is there something good in the dark web? Uh, what, can be what benefits can it bring to the people? Um, thanks, Alina. Uh, th that's a very interesting question. I, I feel that the dark web um, basically just a bunch of hidden services that is, are made available you know, through tools like Tor and so on, um, can provide benefits that any other piece of technology really that has those anonymizing features or pseudo-anonymizing features, shall we say, um, would provide to an individual who needs them. And there are many legitimate use cases for something like uh, the dark web to have hidden services or services that only a few people from a tightly knit community can access. And those could be potentially journalists, uh, could be uh, individuals who are you know, researching or uh, communicating uh, in uh, situations of extreme censorship or duress, for example. Uh, there are numerous uh, websites, for example, the New York Times, that have mirror websites on the dark web to allow individuals to be able to access that when uh, you know that content is usually going to be censored from from the clear net as we as we call it um, you know digital uh, activists as well uh, have many many different use cases for accessing these sorts of services and communicating um, organization of protests sometimes also happens uh, on these uh, uh, you know dark net um, platforms so I, I think there is a lot of uh, interesting uh, use cases for this kind of technology, but over and above that, I also feel that in general, people should have the ability to protect their privacy online, and they should be able to use whatever services are at their disposal, uh, and this is one of them. Uh, and of course, this gives rise to legitimate uh, concerns on the other side of the coin, which we often see by law enforcement, which is that, well, how are we going to be able to tackle uh, cybercrime online? Um, is all hope lost if we have totally anonymized services? And I would say no. Um, we don't necessarily have to throw out the baby with the bathwater, as it's so-called, and get rid of every single privacy-enhancing technology simply because it makes you know, law enforcement difficult. In fact, there have been many, many successful cases of law enforcement uh, that have taken place in darknet contexts. Uh, you know, we saw the shutdown of the Silk Road and the second iteration of that and other darknet markets like Alpha Bay, uh, where there were drugs and other sort of paraphernalia that were stolen being uh, sold online. Uh, we've seen other tools by law enforcement, such as open source intelligence or uh, infiltration to uh, get rid of um, uh, CSAM material uh, on the dark net as well and uh, apprehend those offenders. Uh, we've also seen basically other hacking techniques like, uh, you know, if there's a misconfigured server on uh, the dark net, uh, they can take full advantage of that. They can run as well their own middle relays and exit nodes uh, and, sn you know, sniff content over there as well. So I think there are many different techniques uh, that they can use to fight cybercrime uh, online without having to get rid of that technology in the first place. As I mentioned, it's always an arms race. If you have uh, a removal of this technology, there's going to be another technology to come and replace that. What we need is a principles-based approach to how we balance these issues of anonymity uh, and you know, other legitimate uh, use cases for this kind of anonymizing technology like free expression and so on. So that's to serve my two cents on this. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you, Izan. And actually, yesterday, we had a wonderful talk with... Uh, uh, <laughs> with the tour, the, the tour project, yes. Uh, with the actually uh, the guy, I hope he I hope he will join us maybe uh, today and express the position of the tour project, because they said like interesting statistics that uh, onion services it's like uh, where actually dark web pages exist. They it's like only one to three percent of the whole tour browser traffic, which means that people access tour browser 
uh, specifically not to like do something bad, not to do some kind of criminal activity, or to access even the dark web pages, but just to use it as a VPN service, for example, because it uh, encrypts your uh, uh, surfing traffic, yes, surfing the web. So, but technology develops. Uh, we see that uh, lots of things appear now, and maybe with that technology, it can affect both dark web, dark web tools, and not only and the dark web itself. So my question to Gabriella will be is, how do you think how actual emerging technologies in the future uh, affect the whole dark web? Yes, thank you so much. Um, and I just want to ratify the importance of what was said before. So the dark web and the internet in general is a tool. It's not the enemy. And uh, we're fighting here the criminal organization. So the crime on the internet in the dark web is the problem. Um, so when it comes to emerging technologies, they, of course, can play a significant role. Uh, in the fight against, uh, again, these uh, crimes uh, in the dark net. Uh, the first of all, that is, again, very popular everywhere. If you think of uh, rec tech technologies, uh, is the machine learning and AI. So these technologies can be, for example, uh, employed to identify patterns and anomalies. Uh, in darknet activities, uh, assessing law enforcement agencies in tracking uh, illegal activities and identifying potential threats. Uh, so again, you can just think of what's happening in the banking sector right now. You have the QAC uh, softwares that are helping uh, to understand the different uh, money laundering techniques and patterns. So this is something that can be reused eventually to uh, seek some sort of uh, criminal behavior and anomaly in the dark web as well. Then you have the improved encryption and cybersecurity aspect of it. Uh, so we are talking about developing advanced encryption uh, techniques and cybersecurity measures uh, that can help protect sensitive data and prevent unauthorized access to darknet platforms. So here again, uh, many, many different uh, hacking uh, attacks and attempts are, uh, of course, very much, uh, I would say, uh, popular. Uh, there is a sort of a race between darknet marketplaces right now. So if uh, Silk Road 2.0 or Hydra or many others were shut down, there were a so sort of a, a competition between other darknet marketplaces that were uh, taking, that was taking place and it's uh, still ongoing. So they are trying to undermine each other. And here, of course, this is, uh, you know, something that can be uh, thought of uh, in the future, thinking of a solution in terms of uh, improved encryption cybersecurity. Uh, then you have the blockchain uh, and the distributed ledger technology, which again is very, uh, I would say, popular. It's not a new technology. Uh, but these can be used to create transparent and um, tamper-proof records, making it more challenging for criminals to conduct transactions on the darknet without uh, leaving digital footprints. Uh, then the advanced data uh, analysis, which again is very popular, I would say, in the commercial internet, uh, if you will. Um, so here, again, we're talking about leveraging big data analytics, uh, which could help law enforcement agencies and, uh, of course, other uh, actors to undercover hidden connections, uh, track financial flaws, and identify individuals involved in criminal activities on the darknet. And uh, of course, the collaboration tools are the most important ones today. Uh, so enhanced communication, collaboration tools can improve the coordination among everyone involved. Uh, and of course, uh, work to combat darknet criminal uh, networks uh, altogether. So in Europe, we have the DAS uh, directive a few years ago, uh, which uh, kind of revolutionized, if you will, the overall understanding of cyber crimes. So European uh, uh, countries had to uh, open uh, a cyber crime unit within their organizations, which is very important. And this is exactly what I would generally advocate for in every single country uh, to do. And so again, uh, I would say do not restrict the personal opinions online, because again, we're talking here about different civil liberties and uh, what other speakers were telling about uh, the importance of having the option to be private on the internet. And again, uh, I would say just, um, you know, the focus on the biometric identification of users is, in my own opinion, uh, the wrong direction. I'm seeing several uh, countries trying to implement that type of um, 
uh, tooling, uh, but again, the identification of users is, in my opinion, a wrong focus. We should maybe focus on the technology, we should focus on the uh, software uh, companies, on the applications, how are they used, we should assess like having maybe a technical due diligence of the softwares and trying to actually stop them rather than, uh, or modify the use of software rather than, uh, you know, focus on the users. Thank you, Gabriel. I think that's a wonderful input to our uh, discussion. Uh, we will act, we actually, uh, let's say, uh, we didn't cover one topic uh, concerning dark web, and it is actually the protection of intellectual property. Because many of the people, we actually discussed it, of course, yesterday with the Tor uh, project, they, yeah, they said that uh, many people, of course, use Tor browser for downloading like some, uh, like for pirating. And this actually messes up with the whole uh, system, the whole connection, because it's uh, very, very uh, big files to download. So I want to ask our online speaker, Pedro, question. So how does the usage of uh, dark web tools and actually dark web affect protection of intellectual property? Hi, everyone. Uh, I would like to first of all greet everyone here from uh, Brazil. Hope everyone is uh, all right from the, in the early morning after those amazing IGF nights. But to get back to the issue here, I would like especially to build up uh, upon Eisen comments. And I kind of like to use intellectual property as an example for everything, uh, every thematic that I work on, especially fragmentation sovereignty. Intellectual property can be used as something in the middle of it, because especially when I'm talking about internet, internet governance, uh, intellectual property is at the basis of it, right? So uh, it was among the first uh, most important discussions that we had, uh, that we, uh, we had among civil society, uh, the private sector, government. It kinda, uh, nowadays, it isn't so much on the highlights, but it still comes up from time to time, as uh, something that, uh, kind of inflammates the debate once again. And uh, on this occasion, I would like to use intellectual property infringement as a good example on how deep web and dark nets can be weaponized, uh, argumentatively weaponized, and how they, they are weaponized uh, kind of erroneously uh, as a presentation of the idea that they are something purely threatening, uh, purely menacing, even if the argument is actually absolutely wrong. Uh, after all, when you search for intellectual property in deep web, or more specifically what we're here calling uh, dark web, dark nets, you will tend to think that this is a place created for criminal intent, uh, that it's used only for that. You will see uh, like a lot of uh, lawyer firms talking about intellectual, pro intellectual property crime, uh, uh, crimes happening on these places. And of course, it is a place that facilitates the sharing of illegal copyrighted material. Uh, you can find books and audiovisual contents that are under heavy enforcement on the superficial levels of the internet, uh, with, especially with those wonderful tools that the entertainment industry have to date automatically search and take down content, not always uh, illegal ones. Legal ones also get uh, taken down by this, this sort of tools. And also, some types of severe, uh, severe intellectual property infringements, such as trade secrets commercialization, really are especially problematic here. But the dangers and infringements that are actually kind, uh, they are actually kind of the same of those that we find on the surface net. Uh, and they are even less concerning, considering the sheer number of people that have access to normal websites and those that have access to deep web content repositories. We must remember that copyright infringement is not a problem when just a dozen of people are doing it, but a multitude of people affecting through uh, known market failure, the possibility of existence of a certain business or the possibility of revenue from a creator. And more than that, dark web arguments are actually presented as a paradigmatic example of the alleged, alleged danger, dangers of copyright piracy online. So, People and organizations use the threats of the dark web to actually enhance and extend the fear 
on overall sharing of content online, which ends up just reinforcing even more how these policies are modeled, modeled towards rigid and aggressive systems of copyrights. So these legal frameworks became arguably obstacles to the objectives the aims promote because of the inter informational society reforms that were based exactly on the same idea of how piracy was a pandemic and what we needed to refrain a bit of the internet potential so we could avoid the bigger evil of intellectual property infringements. So the point I would like to talk here and discuss a little bit more later is how, how we need to be careful on how uh, these ideas around dark web and dark net are presented, are used, so we don't end up just trading something that is somewhat problematic for something that's systematically and severely problematic. So back to you. Yes, thank you for your input. And actually, I have a wonderful news because I just found out that joining us online is actually uh, one of the Tor projects. So I actually think that it will be great to hear perspective from the uh, one of the most like famous browser that is usually um, uh, connected uh, with uh, the dark web. But so, uh, Pavel, uh, can we give a word to Pavel Zonev online? Uh, so he can speak. No? Okay. Uh, I will go to the tech team uh, to get, re but uh, before I go, uh, maybe speakers can discuss, can, can make a discussion. Uh, then, we'll, yes, we will just discuss uh, about dark web, how we actually can uh, can we actually regulate it or can we actually um, c control some kind of the thing that uh, in the web because there are lots of you know policies there are lots of uh, laws created to uh, govern the internet because we're all here but can actually parts of the web that we call dark web be governed so I ask this question to every speaker so if anyone wants to start okay I can start Okay, Fifi, yes. Okay, all right. So um, looking at the um, regulating of um, dark web, um, it's, it's quite a complex uh, um, task and very challenging. And, um, but this are, there are some ways that we can regulate because um, we must um, um, ensure that there's a law enforcement and the law en enforcement agencies must be able to investigate and prosecute organizations that use dark web for criminal activities because people can use the dark web um, to um, do good things, good research, as my colleagues were saying. And also um, the technology aspect, um, the government um, company might develop tools that will implement um, to disrupt the dark web activities for criminal activities, that the blocking access and other aspects. And um, one thing that we are all doing is education and awareness. We are creating education and um, awareness. Now, let me give this um, um, small scenario that we'll be able to understand. Um, despite the um, challenging the solution that to regulate dark web. There have been um, some approach in the various years and, and some other research that um, I, I, have, I have done personally, that um, in some cases, um, dark web were trying to be um, regulated. Maybe in, in 2013, um, the FBI shut down um, some Silk Road um, in the largest um, dark web marketplace. And also, when we're looking at in 2022, the UK government announced plans to introduce to um, new legislation that will give enforcement agents more powers to investigate and prosecute dark web crimes. So um, we can also try to um, give much um, education and awareness, and also the technology and policies that we can also try to put it behind in terms of developing new encryption algorithms that can really help to um, um, regulate that. It's a collaborative effort, and one entity cannot do. We are all involved. We must also be able to um, um, be safety on our own use of the um, online tools and resources because dark web, as we are saying, is not only for crimes. You can also use it to um, um, do. And one thing I want to say is that um, in this um, life, you cannot detect darkness um, on, unless you've been in darkness before. So it's it's very important for us to learn um, how we can use this dark web to so that we can make policy and regulation behind this, as Pedro was saying. 
So this is my take on it. Um, there are some few regulations that we can do, but um, it's a collaborative effort um, between um, institutions, we individuals and, um, and stakeholders. Thank you very much. So uh, when we speak about control of our information channels, I mean, tra you know, traffic flows and so on and so on, we should uh, think about how to control our all, uh, you know, I would say, internet, speaking about sovereignty. So uh, if we speak about fragmentation processes, which occurs definitely right now in these geopolitical circumstances, we know what's happening uh, right now in Europe, in the Middle East, everywhere across the globe, and so on and so on. Well, we should uh, see uh, different technological zones. And when we speak about sovereignty, which is a really important topic in, in China, in Russia, in some countries in Europe, in America as well, and so on, and so on, we, uh, uh, we should uh, understand that controlling information channels and traffic for all, uh, I mean, speaking against, against you know, cybercrime and how to protect your own infrastructure, how to protect your own citizens and so on and so on, it's a job for national uh, governments, I, I would say. So uh, when we speak about internet as a global, global network, where we should understand that it's a global network, but control of every uh, part is in hands of uh, local governments, I, I would say. And this is uh, what uh, chi China proposed, what Russia proposed, and uh, what other countries proposed. And uh, this is a good example, because you know when we speak about dark web, but about potential investigation, controlling, monitoring, traffic, and so on and so on, uh, we see uh, fragmentation processes, and it's all about technological sovereignty. So uh, I would give, you know, um, I think it's a good example. When you visit China, uh, you are not allowed to use some Western services. When you are in Russia, for example, there is a strict law uh, which proposes that all data of Russian citizens should be stored in the territory of the Russian Federation. When you go to Europe, to America, there is a huge discussion about, uh, I would say, Huawei equipment, ZT, Chinese manufacturing, and so on and so on, speaking about tech industry. So when we speak, uh, moving back, I, I would like to uh, make parallel with the internet and so on. It's all about hardware, software, and protocols. So if we want to maintain and to control our national um, internet space and our, uh, I would say, information channels, uh, it's really important that uh, we invest uh, in, uh, I would say, technological sovereignty of every country, you know, at the national level. So only if we have a strong, uh, I would say, powerful institutions and, you know, forces and speaking about some agencies and uh, monitoring institutions and so on and so on, we will be able to fight against cybercrime and to, you know, uh, to protect our own uh, interests. Uh, okay, thank you. So you mean that uh, uh, protection of uh, a citizen is uh, in heads of the local government? Absolutely. So, okay. So uh, does everyone wants to add to uh, regulation? You want? Yes, Izan. Thank you. Um, I, I think that's an interesting question, primarily because we need to sort of define what exactly we mean by regulation, because there are already regulations that exist. It's like you know, basic criminal law, don't do crime. Um, so if you're talking about regulation in the sense of, is there a technological way to be able to control what people do online? Well, as I mentioned, it's just an arms race. You know, the government can try as hard as it can to be able to take down these unlawful, like, you know, services and activities, and individuals will try to find ways around that. That's always going to be a cat and mouse game. Um, but in terms of making the lives of law enforcement slightly easier, one interesting uh, example um, of basically a type of forum shopping essentially is that um, law enforcement officials in uh, many parts of the world are not actually allowed to commit crime in the course of fighting crime um, and specifically in the case of the dark web uh, in order to gain trust of individuals who are accused of um, or being suspected of trading with CSAM material you cannot try to gain their trust by 
yourself sending CSAM material to them. Except, uh, unless I'm mistaken, the last time I read, uh, in the case of Australia. So a lot of international cooperation centers around the Australian government because Australian officials are then able to go, um, you know, because they know that they have to be able to gain their trust in order to be able to detect and uh, figure out who these individuals are. And so they are allowed to do that because the judges and the, the laws are drafted in such a way uh, that there is this sort of carve out or exemption. And I think we need to think about solutions like that where you're able to come up with these sorts of um, solutions that don't necessarily involve cracking the technological nut of what Tor and you know, I2P and all of these other sort of uh, services provide, but also enable for a more pragmatic approach towards tackling um, uh, cybercrime in these sort of contexts, in these anonymous contexts. Um, so that's, I think, my sort of two cents on the problem. Because when we talk about regulation, we need to talk about what exactly we're trying to regulate and what mode of regulation are we using. You know, there's, sure, the, the law, uh, but there's also, you know, ways that we can regulate through controlling information flows and data retention and stuff like that as well. So we need to recognize what the limitations of each mode of regulation could be. Because if you say, don't do crime, somebody could still go ahead and do crime. So you need to figure out, okay, is there a technological way that we can deal with this? If there isn't a technological way that we can deal with this, is there a way that we can make our, our own lives easier to be able to tackle you know, the cyber crime when we're going and venturing out into that space? So I feel like there's different sort of approaches and different layers to this problem of regulation um, that need to be considered. It's not really a simple problem, but um, I'm hoping and I have trust in our institutions to be able to do that um, in, in, a, in a balanced manner, basically. Yeah. Thank you, Zana. I think that's actually a very important point you made. So, uh, Gabrielle, you want to add as well, yes? Yes, just a few uh, sentences to what was already said. Um, in how I see it, uh, you know, uh, my profession is to uh, talk and uh, you know about risks and uh, try to mitigate uh, different risks and uh, not go uh, you know in unwanted territories. Let us put it like this. So when it comes to um, the dark web and everything concerning uh, this, I would say that it's uh, a risk in this situation, the abuse of power in the name of fighting crime. So this is something that uh, you know we should uh, be aware of because data is the new oil today, if you will. It's uh, not uh, you know something that is happening uh, from uh, yesterday to today. It's already like uh, from you know a decade that we see this type of uh, activities going. And so uh, what I would suggest is really to uh, focus on cybercrime agencies, on dark web teams that would work actually together with uh, you know the academia with uh, the different uh, uh, you know actors in the field uh, Aeropol for example has a dark web team right now that is focusing exactly on this type of illegal activities, uh, then I would say it's very important also to report uh, illegal activities. So, for example, you know, monkey sees, monkey reports in a very, uh, I would say, uh, private manner because uh, whistleblowers are never uh, welcomed in any country. So this is something that should be normalized, uh, if you will. And then, of course, the awareness and the mandatory, uh, as I see it, cybersecurity educational lessons for government people, for everyone involved uh, in uh, data, uh, you know, whether it's uh, patient data in a hospital, uh, anyone uh, like an administrator in the hospital, uh, the very first person you come and give your ID to, that person needs to go through a cybersecurity, uh, you know, lesson and uh, educational uh, workshop. So this kind of uh, uh, three points that I really feel strongly about uh, is something that uh, is the basis of where uh, we can actually give our input because through you know an agency we can always uh, you know advocate for certain things for certain techniques uh, we can learn from each other and we can help and of course uh, whoever is part of the uh, sector already uh, can definitely uh, support the educational lessons. These are very simple, actually, lessons because uh, you don't need to be, uh, let's put it that way, you know, a technical genius to understand certain things. But everyone knows here in this room that the cybersecurity breaches are generally, uh, you know, connected to human breach. So it's all related to humans. Uh, so we uh, like dogs, or we like, I don't know, Shiba Inu. You click on a link, you do something. Uh, you don't think that person, you know, um, 
is uh, has some malignant thoughts uh, you know it's a lady or it's a young boy but uh, you know this is fishing so you have many many different uh, situations that just regular citizens should be aware of because we're living in a digital era and this is uh, not something that is so special anymore and it just needs to be normalized and uh, put into a system that uh, makes sense for everyone. So everyone should be part of it. And uh, you know this type of topic should be just, uh, again, normalized, standardized in order to tackle this type of uh, topics in the future. Uh, OK, thank you. And so uh, I was told that uh, Pavel is now can uh, add something as a tour project. So please, Pavel, we want to hear your input and your view on the uh, whole dark web. Theme. Thanks for for giving me the um, thanks for giving me the space to to say a few things. Um, ultimately, I think we can mirror a lot of the sentiment that has already been expressed today, in the sense that um, there are probably many more use case use uh, positive use cases as it pertains to um, certainly the use of Tor software, whether it's accessing our network and onion sites. Um, and some of the other censorship circumvention tools that we provide. So ultimately for us, uh, we're helping millions of daily users to securely access the internet and access their right to information and privacy um, and safeguard their um, human rights online. Um, so whether that is you know, from day-to-day -day online activity and protecting your rights to um, say no to non-consensual tracking, to in certain parts of the world even be able to access news sites. So I know onion services have been discussed and what we always point out is the scale and the statistic that you were referencing earlier. Um, so actually, if we're looking at the traffic on our tour network, only 1% uh, or a little over 1% are solely, uh, um, is, is, is traffic that is only directed to onion services. Um, so meaning the sites that are completely confined to the Tor network. So that is an extremely small number, especially if, you know, you want to open up the conversation to potential illicit uses of the Tor network. So that is um, uh, such a small faction that it is really hard to account for any nefarious activity carried online. So what we're seeing is that our network is primarily used for censorship circumvention, for maintaining your right to privacy. And the fun fact actually around um, Onion services is that the most uh, popular Onion service seems to be Facebook um, and news sites. So we're really seeing that these provide a valuable service and people's ability to um, partake in democratic day-to-day um, -day actions. Yes, thank you very much. I think it was important to hear that because people usually associate that to our browser with very illicit activities. And I know because we held a session like during our Youth Russian IJF, um, we had a session about dark web, and one of our speakers said that you should not consider like every user who opens to our browser that he uh, is intended to do something wrong, that he's a criminal just for opening that browser. It's just another browser, and that's just all. So I think we can move mm -hmm. to the... If I may just add. Yes, you, you want to add? Yes. No, just add to that. I think this is a very important point that you make, but that because this is not just Tor browser. This goes back to many other technologies such as encryption. We actually had a panel about this just before yours. But the truth is that there is a very powerful force right now that is trying to malign the use of privacy preserving technology, whatever it is, whether it's Tor or Signal or any kind of other platform that utilizes encryption to make the case that this constitutes some sort of nefarious intent. And that is a very slippery slope. And this is something that we all as a community need to be outspoken um, against. Because I don't know, I don't remember who exactly said that, um, that there is regulation needed and that they have a huge trust in lawmakers. Um, I don't think that people across the globe have the same trust in their lawmakers, especially as we're seeing that a lot of policymakers like the fundamental understanding of how uh, privacy preserving technology actually works to the extent that governing laws are now made that roll back a lot of um, international standards as it pertains to human rights, access to information and freedom of expression. So we need to all be vigilant and um, 
ensure that we continue to have a right to privacy and encryption. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, it was a very important point to make. And uh, so we move to questions, and uh, I give word to my online to our online moderator Maria. So uh, we have some questions in the chat. Uh, so it's uh, yes. Word to yes, you. exactly. Yeah. Hello. Good night. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, we have one question from Habib Koredel, if I read it correctly. Can you share your insight on the potential positive use cases of the dark web beyond its negative reputation and how it might impact the future uh, of online privacy and security? That's the first question, and we want to ask, uh, we want the audience to share other questions, of course, uh, from the online participants and audience. Thank you. Okay, so uh, who would like to answer the question? So the question was. Uh, yes, yeah, okay, yes, Pedro. I think I can go on that because I would also like to comment on something that you were debating. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, you want to, to go back? No problem. No, no yeah, but uh, I actually, Gabrielle and Eisen, uh, I told exactly what I was going to ask, uh, to say. And after that, Pavel uh, commented about cryptography. And the thing here is uh, when we were talking about, uh, about regulating dark web and dark nets, I think if it's... Uh, if it's possible to regulate or not, it's not a real question, not the most important question. But more precisely, uh, why we need to regulate it and what we need to regulate it, because pointing out more precisely what the problem is and how to tackle it without affecting the rest of the technology is really the scope we have here. Uh, the question that have been made about how it might impact the future of online privacy and security is that if we talk about regulating the dark web, uh, regulating the dark, uh, the dark nets, yeah, sorry, the deep web and the dark nets, without being careful about the ideas of more legislation, more regulation, stronger institutions, this may uh, end up becoming a problem to those who care about and use these spaces for uh, good uses, good, uh, good utilizations, such as communication in places. Uh, where freedom of expression is restricted, and so on and so on. Yes, thank you for your input. And going back to the question, so the question was, what other positive uh, things can dark web bring to the ordinary user? But I think we actually covered lots of that, including like uh, that it gives you uh, basically like uh, private connection and uh, freedom of expression in mostly time because you can like uh, access some web services that are not available, uh, for example, in your country, or uh, because actually. Uh, Going back to the conversation with the founder of the Tor browser, you want to add? Yeah, but if you access some services, you know, which are not available in your country, as you mentioned, you violate the laws in your country, you know. So there is a, you know, circle. So how we use technology, and I came, uh, you know, to fragmentation processes. So if you want to regulate something, I think it's not possible to regulate exclusively dark web, deep web, because we see dark web is a part of deep web, and deep web is a part of whole network. You know, so we should, you know, see layer uh, as, you know, one level, all network. So now we need some approach how to deal with some uh, challenges which occurs in geopolitical sphere. Because, you know, if, if you protect something, for, uh, you know, in your country, maybe it will be allowed in, in other countries. So if you access these services, you violate the laws of your country. So it's not the easy discussion from re regulatory side. From the technical aspects, you know, you can do almost everything. And speaking about Tor, speaking about VPNs, about, you know, different aspects, how to protect or, you know, so-called protect your data, traffic, and so on and so on. Uh, I don't think that there is a, you know, uh, right way and, the, and that you are able to protect uh, what are you doing on the network. Speaking about standard stuff, about encryption techniques, about IIS certificates, and so on and so on, it's you know a huge discussion. It's a complex and so on. But I think uh, there is no privacy on the internet. Okay, that's an interesting thought. So, uh, but going back to the question, I think we actually covered lots of the positive impacts of the dark uh, web. Uh, but so. Uh, 
I think uh, if everyone in the audience, like on site, have questions, we will do like one question from on site uh, audience and one question from the online audience. So, do you have? Yes, uh, do you have a mic? Uh, please represent yourself and ask your question. Okay. Um. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ismaila, Ismaila Jawala from the Gambia, and uh, I lead a cybersecurity community in the country, and then we provide um, training for law enforcement and uh, university students, you know, in the areas of cybersecurity, technical research and education. So um, I have a question, but before that, I just want to give a preempt on that. Like, uh, that was this training that we had for one of the law enforcement agencies. And um, one of the inspectors, you know, uh, officers said, uh, Mr. Jawara, if uh, a thief broke into uh, someone's house and the case is reported to the police, we come check, you know, uh, how the thief broke in, maybe the, the door or the window. And if someone has $1 million or dollars in his account and the following morning, you know, it is $0, how do I know which door or window they break? You know, so, so, so what I'm trying to emphasize here is, you know, the issue of dark web and, you know, regulating the internet and all that. I think, you know, as my colleague said, yes, it's important that, you know, we also not notice um, the fact, you know, that uh, local, you know, governments and regulators have different opinions and ways of, you know, things that, I mean, I would say political, you know, uh, uh, will, on how they want to regulate the internet within their space. But also, you know, I think the main purpose of the IGF, you know, is to, uh, for us to have a, a, a common uh, a ground on how we want the internet to be operated and used globally. You know, so for example, what works uh, in, the, in, in the Gambia or Africa, you know, should be uh, something very similar to what works for, you know, uh, uh, US or Ukraine or China. Because if not, what we are going to run, you know, into is that you have these big uh, 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 countries like China, Russia will implement, you know, certain things. Sorry to mention, but then um, how about the already marginalized uh, 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 communities and nations that are already behind, you know, uh, the current, you know, uh, progress of the internet, you know, uh, with regards to education, technical support, accessibility, and all that. How are those people going to fit, you know, into that discussion of, you know, uh, 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 each do your own way, with your own way, at the end of the day, you know, and then considering access to information, right to uh, privacy, and all that. So, I think I just want to understand how these marginalized communities feel fit into uh, this whole discussion, you know, when they are already behind. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, does anyone want to uh, answer this question? I think this is a very important point. Um, yeah, Izan, yes. Thank you. Um, so, international cooperation is definitely one, and capacity building is definitely two. So, you need to be able to train law enforcement, because I think what the, the point that Pavel from Tor made um, is, is a really important one, which is that a lack of understanding of what the technology is and what it's capable of is what leads to really bad uh, policy outcomes and enforcement outcomes. Uh, so, upskilling and definitely giving law enforcement training on cyber crime related issues and how Tor actually works. And as uh, Fifi, uh, who probably isn't there anymore, but as Fifi mentioned earlier, uh, you know, you can't fight the darkness unless you've actually been in the darkness. And in this, it's very similar when it comes to understanding, you know, how browsers like Tor work. You can't regulate in the abstract. You have to actually go in there and figure out how it works and try to, you know, put yourself in the mind of the criminal, essentially. Um, so capacity building is definitely a big one. And then on top of that, you have a lot of already existing international cooperation uh, on fighting cybercrime. You know, it was mentioned previously, we have Europol, we have Interpol, we have AUKUS, we have a whole bunch of different organizations that exist to fight cybercrime on a number of different fronts, be it geopolitical, be it on an individual level, be it organized crime, uh, what have you. Um, so definitely uh, focusing on those two areas, uh, both the diplomatic and the technical, would probably be the best approach that not only yourself, but as mentioned, any uh, nation would have uh, to, to, to fight this issue of uh, cybercrime on the dark net uh, and understand what is capable and what isn't. That's my point of view. I'm not sure if there's anyone else. Uh, does anyone want to add something to the... Well, I think that's it. 
Ah, you want I mean, speaking about fighting against cybercrime, you know, I participated in some, you know, events in, in Serbia, you know, where we had some accident, you know, it's a multi-stakeholder approach. So when, when you want to fight against some, you know, accident or w whatever to, to, you know, in, in, do research, what's happened in investigation and so on and so on, we had a situation that 17 security and intelligence agencies participated in just one investigation. So it's, it's too complex, you know. And sometimes, you know, if you speak about Europol, about some different alliances and so on and so on, it's not enough. You need to go into multi-stakeholder approach and to communicate with a lot of different parties to solve some problems and to, to check what's happened exactly. Because of nature of network and of packet transmission and the traffic flows and so on and so on. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, Maria, back to you. Uh, do we have other questions in the chat? No, really, we don't have any for now, so maybe we'll ask the audience mm -hmm. on site. So, uh, do we have any questions on site? Uh, so, yeah, please take the mic. Good morning to everyone. I'm Tilam from Sri Lanka. Actually, uh, research shows that uh, most of millenn uh, millennials uh, have the bad habits of cybersecurity in cybersecurity uh, when comparing to the Gen X and uh, the older people. So in this context, uh, so actually, why do we think young people are drawn to the dark web? And what are the activities that, uh, that they really engage in? That's my first question. And my last second question is, uh, how, uh, how do you see the landscape of dark web activities alone in the coming years? That's mean in future, in the youth perspective. Thank you. Uh, so I guess the first question is a very uh, interesting one. And I think that uh, personally I will uh, answer that and then give words, of course, to everyone. I think that young people are very, uh, they like to see what is forbidden, because forbidden fruit is the sweetest one, and they always want to try something new. Yes, yes, and it's like, and it's actually because, like, when you restrict something, it is very interesting to know what you're restricting, because it's, especially in the young age, uh, it's a very kind of a protesting things against the system, like you want to do, so you, you want to say, I can do this because I'm young and I know what I do, and the uh, old people out there, they don't actually, don't know what they're doing. I will, know, I will find the right answer. So I think one of the reasons is that. And the other, well, uh, we actually have a new generation alpha that is grew fully in the age of internet. So it was very developed. So they knew how to use a phone probably before they knew how to speak. So probably uh, because of that, they grew with the opinion that internet is not a threat, but it's actually a very good benefit they have. And so if you don't know how to use internet, in, if you're in the generation alpha, I think that y it will be hard for you in the, in the future in the life. So, and they try to use every tool they can find on the internet. Um, so maybe someone can add something to the, the point from our speakers. <laughs> no one? So, uh, Azan, yes. Yeah, just a quick one. So usually why people would use these tools and access hidden services would be either curiosity or privacy or necessity. It's one of those three things. In terms of the landscape changing, I think we may see you know, technological advancements uh, that would further protect privacy, which would again lead to further issues down the line potentially. Um, you know, as Paul mentioned, there's you know, a lot of work that the Tor project is currently doing on anonymization services. There are other anonymization services as well uh, that are popping up. So yeah, that may be one uh, force in the landscape, and another force would be, as you know, again was previously mentioned, the fight against encryption. Um, we will see governments retaliate by saying, you know, we want to undermine encryption in some way or have some back doors. And if you know we don't provide those back doors, then those services will not be allowed effectively, you know, making it illegal to use these kinds of services. So we will see that tension play out, and that tension has basically always existed since the history of the internet. It's just going to be, uh, we're not fighting with sticks anymore, we're fighting with nuclear weapons. That's what it's going to be like, I feel. 
Yes, thank you. So I think we're like uh, actually running out of time. So I will ask every speaker who's left because I know that someone already left uh, to like to have a closing remark, just one minute. Uh, what actually we have discussed thing, and I guess maybe you can answer the question. So should we like treat dark web as a fundamentally dangerous part of the web, or is it more similar like, to the rest of the web? So the basic question, Hello. just uh, your opinion. So. Gab Gabrielle, you want to start? <laughs> well, um, again, as I said before, I would just say that dark web in general is a tool, uh, and it depends on how it's used. Uh, criminal organizations and whoever has bad intentions to uh, deviate from uh, the law uh, in any given country uh, will do that regardlessly, uh, whether you have those tools or any other tools. Uh, because what is important here is that the crime that we're talking here in the dark uh, web is actually the crime offline. It's just the tool that is facilitating to make it, you know, make it uh, look like, uh, you know, something different. You get a, you know, a nice uh, clear net website where everything is shiny and whatever. So it's kind of very easy to actually deflect from this type of uh, you know, situations in case if someone has the intention to do that. So the dark web uh, in, you know, per se is not, again, the enemy. The enemy is uh, the system that should fight more, uh, you know, often and more strongly uh, towards fighting organized crime because this is again just a tool. Uh, I've spoken many times on different con uh, conferences about, uh, you know, different, uh, you know, cybercrime uh, topics. Uh, recently, I'm uh, focusing on uh, uh, AI-powered cryptocurrency, cybercrime, uh, because it's, again, happening in a very unprecedented way, and it's very, very quick. So every second, something new is happening. Uh, 30 millions are all under it, just like that. So it, you just need to be, I would say, realistic and try to un understand that the law enforcement, uh, you know, and many times the politicians are not aware of how the internet works. If you hear you know, some, uh, you know, congressional, uh, U.S. congressional hearings, uh, you know, it's clear that by the questions asked, you know, to uh, Meta, X Facebook, Twitter, X, uh, you know, all these names, but you see that they don't understand what's their business model about. So if you do not understand how they, like, make money, it's difficult for you to understand how other people can actually use that tool to create, uh, I would say, a dark economy for themselves. So uh, there is actually also um, a colleague of mine who uh, got a very interesting idea, and I fully support that, is to actually start hiring people, uh, very creative people who should be uh, you know, from different backgrounds, it doesn't matter, but to try to understand how their software can be manipulated so in a bad manner. So, for example, you have, uh, I don't know, a type of software, uh, can it be misused? Okay, how? Uh, and this is actually something that, uh, you know, is a discussion that is happening among uh, uh, high-tech startups uh, that are working on uh, um, AI, machine learning type of um, Tools, because again, we're creating right now tools that can be easily, you know, manipulated into what other people need. So the dark web, no, it's not the enemy. We should just be more aware, and eventually, uh, I mean, I don't know if that's correct or not, but I would like to open the discussion on a registry, for example, of uh, softwares and their official use, and uh, maybe have like a due diligence, a technical due diligence to understand the different backdoors or the different misuse, uh, you know. Uh, uh, someone who is uh, interested in child pornography uh, or anything like that, they will use even um, games, online games, like there was a, a case of a pony game. So little ponies, you know, between each other, finding each other on a game. And in the chat, you know, pony, pink pony is talking to the black pony, hey, let's meet in room number one, you know? And then they're discussing, you know, a new terrorist attack, or they're discussing where the trade of, uh, you know, illicit narcotics or whatever is going to happen. So, you know, it's just the creativity that never stops. So the tool, 
is not a problem, it's you know the different approaches that is what is important to focus on. Yes, thank you. So, Izan, uh, your last remark? Uh, just to keep it very brief, I'm very glad that amongst the panelists here there's some consensus about the fact that, you know, Tor is just a tool and there are many positive and, you know, necessary use cases for this technology and uh, the fact that, you know, law enforcement has other mechanisms that exist and it's not, you know, all hope is lost for cybercrime. Um, and, uh, yeah, like, you know, it's always a perpetual arms race. We'll probably be revisiting this question in the next 20 years again with a different kind of technology, so we'll see. Yes, thank you. Uh, I also have online Pedro. You want your last remark? Yeah, really fast. Uh, I would just like to highlight that things are not manicheistic, even on situations that they seem really easy to define and precise. So answering many questions that were posed before, with just one example, dark webs are also used for sharing academic documentation in an academic ec ecosystem that is very unjust towards poorer countries. So it is a crime, or at least in civil infringements, but it's may, it maybe is less uh, of an ethical problem than part of the science publishing industry. For example, those that are sustained with public funding and still charges a charge at uh, thousands of dollars per access. Yes, thank you. And we have left with Milos. So your final remarks. Okay. So as a conclusion, I, I, I will give you a strategic approach. From my perspective is that you know we can use all technologies on the right side, on the dark side, on the way how we think is right at the, at the end. So, you know, but speaking about dark web, about deep web, it's all just the service of internet, I, I would say, and the door to, uh, and Tor as an application and so on. So yeah, uh, let's end with this. That you know, my approach is that uh, we need to strengthen our local institutions and uh, speaking about cybercrime, fight, fighting against cybercrime. So this is a way how we can protect internet globally because uh, we need some processes, we need some fragmentation processes. We will see how it will and, uh, you know, how internet will look like in, in the near future. So yeah, my approach is that we have to fight uh, against cybercrime with common approach, but on authorities as a local governments. So thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us online on our site. I think we had a wonderful discussion. So uh, we can, of course, talk after session. And if you want like to speak uh, more with uh, like us, we have like a booth in the Booth Village, Central for Global IT Cooperation. You can always come, and we have a wonderful discussion there. Thank you very much.